Special thanks to Tokyo Treat and Sakurako for sponsoring today's video. Before we get started, there will be spoilers for the Thousand Year Blood War Arc of Bleach in the video to come. Evil is an enormous word. It's an overwhelming and intimidating word, and one that shouldn't be thrown around lightly. And yet, today, I want to try and rank who I believe to be the top 10 most evil characters in Bleach. It's no easy task, as Bleach has its fair share of vile villains, but also several morally questionable characters too. One of the beautiful things about the cast of Bleach is that it comes in so many different shades of grey, but we're going to attempt this nonetheless. Now, evil is defined in the Oxford English Dictionary as profoundly immoral and wicked, while immoral is further defined as not conforming to accepted standards of morality. So that gives us some basis to work from when trying to create a criterion for those making it onto the list. I have to be honest though, this is probably one of the toughest lists I've ever compiled on the channel. I've tried to look at the characters involved from a number of different perspectives. In what sense are their actions and goals evil? What terrible atrocities do they commit and how does it affect those around them? How do they feel about said actions and were said actions justifiable in any way whatsoever? Have the characters in question shown any inclination towards the light, or are they all just monsters through and through? The world of Bleach isn't as simple as to be merely split down the middle, separating good and evil characters into camps as explicit as black and white. This list would be a lot easier to make if it were. And so, without further ado, this is my list of the top 10 most evil characters in Bleach. As always, let me know your own lists down in the comments, as well as the reasoning behind your picks, and we'll see if our lists have any similarities at all. Now, as always, I want to kickstart this list with a few honourable mentions. Honestly, there were quite a few characters that could have made this list, from violent beasts like Driscoll Bercy, where killing is actually a part of his power, to more understated and calculated evil like Giriko Kutsuzawa, who tested his newfound Fulbring power by murdering his wife. However, these honourable mentions are characters that I believe display some evil or immoral qualities, who have committed one or more dubious acts throughout the series, but ultimately fight for the side of good at least in a narrative sense anyway, where the Soul Society are seen as the overall protagonists. And unusually, we actually have two characters occupying the same spot today, both of whom herald from a thousand years ago. The founder of the Gotei 13 and the leader of a band of bloodthirsty murderers, Yamamoto Shigakuni, and the original captain of the 11th Division turned motherly healer to the Gotei 13, Yachiru Unohana, once the most infamous and monstrous criminal to stalk the streets of the Soul Society. It's well documented that Yamamoto once led a gang of power-hungry, brutal thugs and killers who were guards in name only, kept in line thanks to Yamamoto's own ruthlessness before he eventually transformed them into the kinder, more honourable Gotei 13 that we know today. In Yuhabak's words, Yamamoto was little more than a demon of the sword, who cared just as little for his own men as he did his enemies on the battlefield. Yamamoto is perhaps the most clear-cut example of an ancient captain having some, or should I say several thousand skeletons in his closet, and his Bankai Zanka no Tachi is a living testament to the head captain's once murderous ways. His follower Unohana was just as wicked. As we saw from her brief flashback, her subordinate mistakenly attributes an enormous mound of corpses to her work, implying that she's been known to butcher that many people in the past just to try and satisfy the endless bloodlust of her blade. And so it seems Yamamoto was responsible for ruling over a blood-soaked hellscape. It's a hard-hitting truth that the legacy of the Gotei 13 today is stained by the stench of death from its earliest days, and these two terrible killers stood at the very top of a mountain of bodies. However, the reason Yamamoto and Unohana don't quite make the list proper is because they've since spent an entire millennium trying to atone for those sins of the past. 
Unahana set her sword aside completely, devoting herself to the healing arts that she once used to prolong her battles. Now they're being used to help care for and save the lives of the weak and injured. The Thousand Year Blood War arc shows us that neither of these characters were ever able to truly leave those lives behind. Both Yamamoto and Unohana are forced to reckon with not only their past mistakes, but their past selves when they rear their heads once more. In the end, both characters ultimately die when their past catches up to them, the final atonement. Whether a thousand years of trying to make up for what they did is enough in your eyes will be your decision to make, but at the very least acknowledging the monsters they were and the fact they couldn't continue to live that way is a start. But first up on our list is a hollow once considered among the oldest and foulest of the lot. Grand Fisher. While it could be said that Grand Fisher simply does as all Hollows do, which is attempt to devour souls, special attention is given to this most vile of creatures who preys on Shinigami by exploiting their deepest emotional connections. Using his lure, Grand Fisher has outwitted and killed Shinigami for 54 years. Rukia notes the Soul Society has an extensive database on him and considers him to be a true low life. As we see in the story, Grand Fisher acts as Ichigo's first real test. Revealed to be the Hollow who killed and devoured Masaki's soul, Grand Fisher attempts to use the image of Ichigo's mother against him in their battle, hoping it'll prevent Ichigo from attacking him. Grand Fisher might be an animalistic monster like the other Hollows we meet early on in the story, but he's clearly intelligent and sadistic, taking pleasure from toying with his victims. When battling Ichigo, Grand Fisher is able to go so far as to replicate Masaki's voice, using his puppet to try and dissuade Ichigo from fighting, while lapping up the fact that Ichigo is horrified and saddened at the way the Hollow is defiling his mother's memory. Later, when Grand Fisher evolves into an imperfect Aranka, he retains his malevolence, seeking revenge on Ichigo for his earlier defeat. Even when gaining a semblance of humanity and supposed intelligence, Grand and Fisher's personality remains the same. Now, this one is a little debatable, but it's also one of the entries that I find the most fun and interesting. Coming in at number 9, we've got the leader of the Zero Division, and perhaps the most ancient Shinigami of all time, Ichibei Hyosube. Now, when I posted a few polls recently asking you who you felt was the most evil character in the series, Ichibei completely dominated his bracket which was actually a little surprising. That being said, I firmly believe he deserves a place on this list, but it's a bit more complicated than simply saying he's evil and being done with it. Ichibe belongs to a similar group of characters as Kisuke Urahara and Kyoraku Shinsui, characters who act for the overall collective greater good of maintaining the status quo, and in doing so, commit some often morally questionable acts. Kyoraku's famous quote sums them up well. I don't believe using evil to defeat evil is itself an evil act, but of course that is up for your interpretation. The difference between Ichibei and characters like Kisuke and Kyoraku, however, and the main reason they don't make this list while he does, is that they are both capable of relating to and understanding people on a human level. They're capable of showing sympathy, of understanding pain and suffering, love, and other things that might drive a person. Now, Ichibei doesn't act out of malice, at least not all the time anyway. He's definitely spiteful in his battle with Yuhabak. But being essentially the envoy of the Soul King himself, the leader of the Zero Division has been around since the very beginning, and thus has witnessed every conflict, every wrinkle in the fabric of history, right down to the splitting of the world into three, and the sealing and mutilation of Rayo. Because of this, Ichibei is inhuman in his separation. He is aloof to the point of complete and utter indifference, unable to relate to the ideas of friendship or suffering. Ichibei exists to ensure the status quo his status quo is maintained, no matter the cost. His ultimate contingency plan to force Ichigo into eternal damnation as the new Soul King should they have needed it 
is extremely dark and taken without any consideration for the boy whatsoever. Like I said, Ichibe doesn't act out of willful malice, but I would argue his indifference is a form of evil. It's this complete lack of humanity in any form whatsoever that makes Ichibe truly terrifying and why I suspect so many people voted for him. Ichibe is callous. He has a total disregard for almost every other being around him. They exist as a means to an end, which is something that will crop up again and again on this list. In Can't Fear Your Own World, Ichibe remarks that he takes no sides, but if push came to shove, he might help the Soul Society because he likes the Kyoraku boy at the time. And speaking of Kyoraku, when he chats with Ichibe in the war's aftermath, Kyoraku, himself an ancient and hardened Shinigami, notes how sad it would have been for Ichigo to suffer the fate that now befalls Yuha Bark's corpse, to which Ichibe merely says that he would have missed talking to him with a toothy smirk on his face. I don't feel I can put Ichibe any higher on the list than this, because as I said, he isn't acting willfully out of wickedness, but he is absolutely immoral. Now, up next, I'm cheating a bit again here with another two-character entry, but I think it makes sense. In eighth place, we've got the villainous leader of Execution and the first substitute Shinigami, Ginjo Kugo, as well as his second in command, Shukuro Tsukishima. Let's begin with Ginjo. As the main villain of the Lost Agent arc, much of the responsibility for what takes place in this storyline falls to him. Now, now yes, let's deal with the elephant in the room first. Ginjo was wronged by the Soul Society in a pretty massive way. In fact, the lies concocted by Tokinada completely destroyed Ginjo's life, forcing him on the run and turning the Gote 13 into his enemy. But does that really excuse Ginjo's plan in the present day? Ginjo's war is with the Soul Society, yet he revels in a much more personal, much more intimate level of evil by inflicting that pain upon an innocent Ichigo instead. While Ichigo is affiliated with the Soul Society, not only does he not have powers when Ginjo begins manipulating him, but as a fellow substitute Shinigami, if anything, Ginjo should have pitied the boy. Instead, though, he comes to Ichigo when our hero is at his lowest and offers him his hand, fully intending to not only exploit and string Ichigo along before stealing his hard-earned powers in the end, but even worse, his plan involves mentally and psychologically breaking Ichigo, damning him to a painful existence where his family and friends see him as a violent monster who completely lost his mind. Don't forget that after stealing his powers, Ginjo planned on just leaving Ichigo and never seeing him again, meaning Tsukishima's Book of the End would never be reversed and Ichigo would be forced to live out the rest of his life with his family family and friends that didn't trust him or see him in a truthful light ever again. Ichigo's entire goal, his entire reason for being, is to be strong enough to protect those he loves. So Ginjo's evil strikes at his heart perhaps more than any of the other villains in the series. Yes, Ginjo has an inarguably tragic past, but it doesn't make what he does to Ichigo and what he's done to apparently many others right at all. Then there's Tsukishima, who I originally had planned on making the sole member of execution to grace this list. However, the more I think about it, the more I realised these two are two sides of the same coin, and it makes sense to have them both here. Tsukishima is a genuine sociopath, terrifying in the way he so casually inflicts Ginjo's will upon Ichigo and his friends with no concern for the ramifications. But it goes even further than that, too, Tsukishima takes a sick pleasure from manipulating the pasts of his victims and pushing them beyond the point of no return. With an evil glee, Tsukishima forces more and more significant memories into Chad and Orohime's minds, crippling them with insanity until they're saved by the timely appearance of Urahara and Ishin. Ginjo even notes that Tsukishima has broken many people in the past in that same way, implying Tsukishima Shima and by extension Ginjo must have a string of mentally scarred victims 
who will never recover. Kubo even uses his ultimate storytelling device, his art, to depict Tsukishima's depravity in a way that no other villain really is. In the original black and white material, Kubo had a special way of shading Tsukishima that he never really used on any other character. Tsukishima's face would be shadowed, but his eyes were left a gleaming white, giving him a terrifying appearance. And speaking of his eyes, they are decidedly inhuman. Unlike virtually every other character in Bleach, Tsukishima's eyes, especially for just a supposedly normal human, are completely black, save for a twinge of light. Kubo's own very clever way of telling us that this character has very little good within them at all. When creating this list, I entertained quite a few different Sternritter entries. After all, a lot of them are twisted monsters and some of the most despicable characters in Bleach. Pepe uses his power of the love to control the hearts and minds of others, forcing them to his will, while Asnod relishes in killing people with overwhelming fear, even going so far as to mock Biakia over his life-threatening injury sustained in their first battle with his sick sense of humour. However, for seventh place on this list, I feel it has to go to Sternritter Z the Zombie Giselle Jewel. Ostensibly introduced as the kooky member of this group of friends, a much darker, thoroughly detestable side to Giselle is later revealed as the second Quincy invasion unfolds. Giselle's power of the zombie enables her to manipulate people as though they were her puppets, forcing many Shinigami to kill themselves upon their own Zanpak toe. However, it's how Giselle treats her allies that makes her truly monstrous. After Bambietta is defeated by Komamura, Giselle brutally murders her before resurrecting her as a zombie, gaining complete and total control over the stern Ritter who was supposedly once her friend. Now, the anime actually makes Giselle's actions here look a little more sympathetic as it's clear she's acting to save Bambietta from a much more permanent fate at the hands of Hashwolf for her failure. And yet, once Giselle gets Bambietta to herself, when she and the other Bambies are split up, this character's true nature emerges from the shadows. Giselle begins torturing and abusing Bambietta, smacking her across the face before pulling her up by her hair for no reason other than to lord her power over her. Giselle has little to no care for Bambietta whatsoever, completely disregarding the person, the friend she once was, and instead employs her as a disposable meat shield, forcing Bambietta to endure serious injuries in order to protect herself. For example, grabbing her and letting her take the brunt of a massive explosion, reducing Bambietta to a smouldering wreck while Giselle walks away unscathed. Not only that, but Giselle's evil runs deeper. She seems to believe she now owns Bambietta in a sickly perverse way, gaining a twisted satisfaction by teasing the stern Ritter in an overtly sexual manner, while what Bambietta is truly after is Giselle's blood, in an effort to keep herself alive. Yet, when finally injured herself, Giselle attempts to drain Bambietta of the blood she once gave her before bashing her head in against a rock when Bambietta protests, Giselle demanding her friend return her loaned blood to her. Basically, Giselle wants to have it both ways. She's happy to give up her blood to restore Bambietta to life, but she doesn't actually consider Bambietta to be a living being at all, which explains her cold and horrifying disposition. While it felt like Giselle and Bambietta's abusive relationship kind of came out of nowhere originally, it is clearly supposed to mirror the former relationship between Mairi and Nemu, which is something we'll get to yet, don't worry. Now, for the only Espada to have the dubious honour of gracing this list, we're of course looking at the eighth Espada, Xyloporo Grands. Though again, I think a few of them could have probably made it, to be honest, from Neutra's rampant sexism to Barragan's tyrannical regime. However, as Waco Mundo's resident mad scientist, Xyloporo is a truly evil maniac, obsessed 
with acquiring perfection. Xyloporo's villainy is clear from the time we spend with him in the source material. He's created himself an army of Fraxion, whose only real purpose is to exist, to then be cannibalized by him should he need their flesh to empower and restore himself. Not only that, but his flagrant disregard for life is shown when he obliterates the army of clones he creates with a snap of his fingers, something that makes even Renji feel uneasy. The Espada's callous and uncaring nature extends even to his own kin, however, as he reveals that not only is he unbothered by the death of his older brother Ilfort, but he considers Ilfort to be a worthless fool, only useful because Xyloporo had implanted his body with countless parasitic surveillance bugs, and in Xyloporo's own words, his brother was little more than a box to carry said bugs around in. Xyloporo's Gabriel ability is perhaps one of the series' most grisly techniques, impregnating an unwitting Nemu before emerging from her very cells, draining her of life in the process, and turning her into a desiccated husk. Speaking of Xyloporo's many techniques, it's clear he enjoys playing with his food as he spends an awful lot of time merely torturing Uryu and Renji, slowly destroying their internal organs piece by piece as he toys with them both from his godlike position. In fact, of all of the characters on this list so far, Xyloporo is really the only one that has faced any kind of real judgement in the afterlife, as of course he returns in the Hell Chapter chapter as the primary villain, now appearing in Hell as some kind of new demonic being, but of course we don't know too much about him, other than that he was evil and vile enough to go there in the first place. However, the extent of Xyloporo's evil is truly revealed in the light novel Spirits Are Forever With You, where it was explained that as humans, he and his brother worked for a powerful nation, where Ilfort was able to regularly supply Xyloporo with a constant string of prisoners to perform his inhumane, cruel, and fatal experiments on. Even when Xyloporo was eventually murdered by these same lost souls that he created, he forced himself to become a hollow, going so far as to then devour his own brother. But as we reach the halfway point of this list, it's time for a message from today's sponsor. Spring is finally upon us, and this month Tokyo Treat and Sakurako are celebrating Hanami, Japan's famous cherry blossom viewing season, with these beautifully decorated boxes that are filled with Japanese snacks and treats, which Jade and I are going to take a look at today. Japan's Sakura season, filled with parties and festivals is renowned for its enchanting beauty, and that's reflected here in the limited edition design of these Sakura pink boxes that look as though they could quite easily be themed after Byakuya's Senbon Sakura itself. We have here with us boxes from both Tokyo Treat and Sakurako, and while they are similar in function, both subscriptions offer very different experiences, yet both are designed to enable you to experience the beauty and whimsy of Japan and its traditions from your own home. Tokyo Treat is a monthly pop Japanese snack subscription box that includes up to 20 of the latest limited edition and seasonal snacks. This month's theme is Sakura Snacktastic, and for the 100th volume of Tokyo Treat, they've really chosen a stunning selection of snacks that encapsulate both the traditions of springtime in Japan and the Hanami celebration of cherry blossoms, such as Sakura Leaf Senbei, a Sakura Castella Cake, and Mitsuya Cider. So, first things first, from Tokyo Treat, we're trying this pear tart, which Looks pretty stunning on the cover, oh though. I'm not entirely sure it's going to look like that. Okay, the plot thickens. It says it says <laughs> it's, it's a chocolate, chocolate pie. pie. I think it's supposed to be a pear That's, pie. What does it say it in there? It says it's a pear pie. Let's open it. White chocolate filling, it says right there. Oh. So I not mean, a pear the filling. The pear is very central. Yeah, I wonder what's going to... It's gone. I wonder what's going to be stronger, the taste of pear or chocolate. Oh, my God. It smells like pear. That's the first thing I get. Pear, then chocolate. Oh, no one. Mm. I get pear a lot more than I get chocolate. Do you? Mm. We're going to try this because we saw the name in the booklet and we thought it sounded awesome. So mm. they call it Strawberry Black Thunder, <laughs> which sounds so epic. Yeah. I think it's basically, yeah, a chocolate crunch bar with a tart strawberry twist. Can we snap this thing? Probably not. Oh, uh, well, it didn't really work. You can have the bigger part. Oh, there you go. thank you so much. They like the strawberry flavouring in Japan, it feels like. It's, it's so nice. strong with Japanese snacks as mm. well. But I really like that. I don't know where the thunder comes in. Mmm. That's true, yeah. Black Thunder. It says it's a famous chocolate crunch bar. Maybe it's the crunch. 
That's the thunder. One epic name for a chocolate bar that tastes mm. so sweet. Meanwhile, Sakurako supports local Japanese snack makers with a focus on traditional artisan Japanese snacks as well as authentic Japanese tea. Each box also comes with a lovely piece of Japanese tableware. In this month's box, we've got an incredibly cute and meticulously designed Neko Sakura dish featuring little cats amongst cherry blossoms. As with Tokyo Treat before it, the theme for Sakurako this month is Beauty of Sakura, emphasizing the natural splendor of the season with snacks such as Sakura Doriaki, Sakura Honey Kuzumochi, and some delightful Sakura Sweet Tea, which contains real cherry blossoms that bloom in hot water. Right, so first up, yes, we're gonna try Sakura Mochi. So nice. It's so glittery. So glittery. Oh, how glittery it is. We've tried these before, I believe, in one of the previous boxes, like maybe a year ago or so, and when I first saw them, I was like gutted because I thought, oh my God, they look really nice, mm -hmm. but I'm almost certain they're not gonna be vegetarian. And they are vegetarian. And it makes me very happy. Who would have thought that Sakura would make a good flavouring? Very nice. And it looks so cool. Oh my god. We need to eat these. What are they? Donut boughs, bows, soaked in honey with plenty of cherry blossom syrup. Oh. Oh my god. These crispy fried donut balls. Oh, they do, they do smell <laughs> like, uh, like the beach or something. They're, very, they're covered in honey with cherry blossom syrup and I'm so excited. I saw mm. these in the box and I was like, yeah, we're having these. Yeah. It's nice. Again, Everything I'd imagine Tastes it like Sakura. Be. Yeah. Oh, it's so Tastes nice. like sakura in donut form. I actually said to someone earlier about the sakura flavoured um, snacks and they were like, so what does it taste like? And I was like, well, it's kind of like cherry, but we just don't, it's just not something we do here. Like I know in Japan, they, they were like expecting the, you to say leaves. <laughs> tastes like a tree, yeah. <laughs> and of course, as mentioned earlier, no matter which box you choose, each one comes with a detailed booklet that tells you everything you need to know, not just about the snacks inside, but also the theme of the month as well. For example, the Sakurako booklet this month dives into the different styles of cherry blossoms that can be found throughout the season, which is really interesting and not something I knew either. No. So it's cool <laughs> to be able to not only enjoy the snacks themselves, but learn a little more about the celebrations and the traditions found behind them as well. But that's it for March's stunning springtime boxes. As always, I want to say a big thank you to Tokyo Treat and Sakurako for supporting the channel by sponsoring today's video. If you want to treat yourself or somebody you love to one of these boxes to help ring in the season of Hanami, then make sure to follow the links down in the description and the pinned comment and use my code for $5 off your purchase. Thanks everyone and enjoy. All right, this next character embodies a much more traditional and straightforward form of evil. Theatrical and pompous yet cruel and sinister to the core. Sternritter J, the Jail, Kirge, Opie, and the captain of the Vandenreich's hunting army. Look, the Vandenreich as a faction are clearly modelled, in part, on the Nazis of World War II, and Kirge, as one of our first touchstones with this new villainous organisation, is perhaps the purest distillation of that. I mean, his design is literally based on Heinrich Himmler, one of the top brasses of the Nazi regime. But as the captain of the hunting army, it's Kierge's job to subjugate and control the Irankar, helping to facilitate the invasion into their home world, and then set up shop there as a Vandenreich outpost. The imagery used here is pretty strong. Under Kierge's orders, the Irankar are dehumanised and chained to one another, forced to march in single file before Kierge himself gets off his throne and begins murdering them one after the other, to the point where even his own men begin to suspect he doesn't really want to recruit any hollows at all, and is just using this exercise as an excuse to butcher them. One of the scariest things about Kierge is that he's clearly a devoted zealot. The man believes in what he's doing as he commits genocide in Waco Mundo, firmly taking the stance that the Hollows are a wicked and lesser race. When Kyrgyz uses Sklaveri to absorb Ion, he unironically says that he didn't want to have to use this power lest his holy wings be tainted by evil. Then there's Kyrgyz's shrift, the Jail. Remember, the shrifts are supposed to be a reflection of something the Quincy is missing within their soul, something that embodies them as a person. For Kyrgyz's shrift to take the form of an inescapable jail cell that he can imprison non-Quincy's in tells you everything you need to know about this monster. 
His very personality shows a desire to dominate those he deems impure, and it's this villainy that helped make him such a memorable enemy at the start of the Thousand Year Blood War arc. When a single villain is nasty enough to force former enemies into an alliance just to bring them down, you know they're doing something right. Up next, falling just outside of the top three, is perhaps the most obvious inclusion of them all the diabolical captain of the 12th Division, Mayuri Kurotsuchi. Mayuri's wicked ways are well known, and from the moment he arrives in the story, he's up to no good. Whether he's threatening Ikaku for information, or nearly killing a nurse who attempts to intervene, Mayuri is completely unhinged in the Soul Society arc, and it only escalates from there. Myri is revealed to be nothing short of a total madman, subjecting anyone he can to his inhuman experiments for no reason other than to satiate his mad curiosity. The introduction to his battle with Uryu is perhaps one of Bleach's most horrifyingly effective moments, as an innocent and seemingly totally unaware Shinigami officer is brutally killed by his captain, his body trans transformed into a living sacrificial bomb, along with many others. Kubo made sure to show us the moment of death from the officer's perspective, taking a few pages, which is pretty unheard of, to detail the young man's very real, very relatable hopes and aspirations before watching as his outstretched arm swells and expands before his very eyes as he then bursts into a ball of fire. Mayuri simply looking on with a grin, comparing the man to little more than a thrown grenade. Myri views people as playthings to be toyed with, to be poked and prodded and experimented on without their consent. As he details the horrific conditions that he would give to Orohime were she to submit herself to testing willingly, we realise that the vast majority of his subjects have it far, far worse, treated as little more than beasts before meeting a violent end, if the terms Myri is giving Orohime are what he considers to be charitable. And then, of course, there is Myri's extremely disturbing treatment of the Quincy's, as the captain launches into a sadistic tirade about the various ways he's inflicted suffering upon them in his quest to learn more, from drilling holes into their skulls while they were still alive to making them burn their own children for some reason all in the name of science. And finally, of course, there's Myri's appalling treatment of his own artificial daughter, Nemu, who he regularly brutalises in front of Uryu. Myri believes that she is his to do with as he pleases, requiring her to sacrifice herself in order to get the better of Uryu during their battle, and then stamping on her repeatedly when she dares to ask for aid after being seriously wounded as part of his plan. All of this sounds pretty awful, so why then is Myri only fourth on the list? Well, to be honest, it wasn't easy, but the truth is that for the majority of the series, Myri is a very different character. Sure, Kubo keeps the general idea of Myri alive, but he's mellowed out considerably after the Soul Society arc. Once the Gote 13 become aligned with the protagonists, it seemed like Kubo realised Myri was too much of a villain and needed to be scaled back. From this point on, any atrocities that Myri commits are no longer for his own personal curiosity but for the supposed sake of the Soul Society, and he's even actively heroic multiple times during the Thousand Year Blood War arc. Kubo goes to great lengths to humanise Myri, and while many of us expected him to face the retribution of the Quincy's in the final arc, that judgement never came. Perhaps Kubo himself felt Myri no longer deserved it. Moving on to the top three now, and in third place we have the Emperor of the Vandenreich, son of the Soul King and the progenitor of the Quincy's himself, Yuhabak. Now, Yuhabak is a very interesting villain. Despite his status as the overarching antagonist of the final arc of Bleach, many of Yuhabak's goals are steeped in nobility. He wants to spare his father of his undying humiliation, saving him from a fate worse than death inflicted upon him by the Shinigami, while also removing death from the cycle of rebirth by restoring the three worlds, Soul Society, Waco Mundo, and the world of the living, 
to their original primordial state. Despite this, however, no matter what form Yuharbark's personal desires might take, the man is a cold-hearted monster through to his very core. Yuharbark is a warmongering, bloodthirsty, genocidal maniac. Cold and calculating, Yuharbark will crush any who oppose him and the rise of his empire. Remember Kirge Opie and how he compared him to the very real evil of the Nazi regime? Yuharbark is the absolute source, the epicenter of that pure blood ideology in the Bleach universe. It all stems from him. Yuharbark gleefully subjugates Waco Mundo, considering all Arankar to be lesser beings, violently murdering even those that he takes into his employ, while hand-waving away the fact that he can always find more. Yuharbark is a relic from a bygone age, where Yamamoto and Unohana have spent a millennium trying to atone for their sins, Yuhabak revels in those very sins, coming from an age where all that mattered was steel, strength, and blood, and he believes the new values that the Gote 13 tries to stand for to be little more than a pathetic weakness, seeing that same weakness in Yamamoto, who he mocks and disrespects as he tramples over the Soul Society. Evil is essentially in Yuhabak's nature. Like I said, no matter his end goal, you can simply see what kind of a person he is in the way he acts, the way he talks, and the way he views the world. Due to his distorted upbringing, itself a direct result of his twisted powers that saw him be worshipped as a god by those that didn't know any better, where in fact they were really all making a deal with the devil, Yuhabak believes that everything in the world exists for his taking, and that everything is his to do with as he pleases. This belief extends most tragically to his own kind, the Quincy. Yuhabak likes to act as their messiah, their all-father, even going so far as to directly call them his children, but he doesn't care about any of them. All Quincy are merely tools to be used by him, even the Stern Ritter, many of whom are simply butchered to feed their master's power. Many of the Stern Ritter blindly follow their god king, who has instilled in them this cult of personality surrounding himself, when in reality their faith and worship is repaid only in blood, as Yuhabak drains and kills them on a whim. We see that several of the Quincy live in constant fear, awaiting the day when Yuharbark sees them as expendable fodder to feed his ever-hungry war machine. And of course, Yuharbark is responsible for the deaths of both Ichigo and Uryu's mothers. Yuharbark even tells Ichigo directly that Masaki's life was relinquished for his own, and that she should feel no greater honour. The truth is that Yuharbark's very existence is a cancer on the world of Bleach. His very power is parasitic, designed to give people the hope and strength they need to carry on, only to eventually cruelly strip everything from them when Yuharbark deems their time and usefulness to be up. It is true that Yuharbark does seem to care about his father to some degree, but other than that, Yuhabak cares about nothing and no one but himself, keeping his own strength burning at all times while his children fight and die in a pointless war for him. It's very fitting that an arrow outfitted with the power of Alsvalen is what eventually helps to bring Yuhabak down. It's symbolic of the revenge of every Quincy he's ever purged, every Quincy he's ever used, and the world of Bleach is much better off without him. Now, as we arrive at the top two, this is perhaps where I struggled the most. In my mind, the top two were only ever made up of these two villains. It was just a case of who would end up taking the very top spot. And so in second place, we have the former captain of the 5th Division turned traitorous ruler of the Arankar, Sosuke Aizen. Aizen is an extremely well-rounded character and one of Bleach's very best. 
As a result, the depths of his evil and his depravity are felt on almost every level of the narrative. Eisen's evil, his ambition, his sinister influence, his transgression, can at one point encompass the entire world as he threatens the lives of thousands of innocent people to achieve his goals, while at the same time it can shrink down to the most intimate and cruel of betrayals and everything in between. Eisen has two major goals throughout his tenure as the Big Bad of Bleach. To kill and supplant the Soul King, and to become a being that transcends both Shinigami and Hollow. Let's start with the first goal, which is not as altruistic as Aizen might make it seem on the surface. Although Aizen questions why Kisuke wouldn't want to change the world with the superior mind that he has, as we find out at the end of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, Aizen doesn't have any greater selfless reasoning in mind behind his conquest, he simply strives to crush all who would stand above him, including the Soul King. Aizen desires godhood to be at the very top, and is willing to step on every ant to get there. And where Kisuke is concerned, Aizen can't fathom how someone so brilliant could be so content. Aizen despises the Soul King, yes, and the truth of the Soul Society's governing monarchy, but he is driven by the desire to be the engine of relentless change itself, even at the cost of so many lives who would otherwise have nothing to do with his plan. Aizen desires the deaths of everyone in Karakura Town in order to make the Oken, but he's willing to spare the lives of the Gote 13 soldiers who defend it out of respect towards them. But in reality, this respect is little more than arrogance, coming from a man who looks down on each and every one of them as something far smaller than he. Then there's Aizen's desire to transcend as a being greater than both Shinigami and Hollow, to break taboo boundaries and push the limits of research and reward. In a way, this is perhaps Aizen's most evil aspect. The amount of lives he's needlessly destroyed, that he's left in his wake with his holofication experiments, is terrifying. From the unfortunate Rukongai citizens that he initially targeted, their bodies obliterated due to the holoreatsu infection, to the lives of those he once professed to call colleagues. For those who stick their fingers in their ears and claim that Aizen isn't evil, but a misguided hero striking out against a totalitarian regime, I will always point you to the Turn Back the Pendulum arc. Aizen joyously subjects numerous captains and vice captains to his horrific experimentation, changing their lives forever against their will, seeing them as little more than animals, subhuman test subjects, despite having lived with some of these people for years. In my mind, there is very little colder than the moment Shinji tries to ask Aizen what holofication means as his body is slowly being consumed by it, and Aizen simply turns to him, his captain, and says with a grin on his face, there's no need for you to know. Knowing that Shinji only has minutes left before death. Much like Tsukishima before him, Aizen is a true sociopath, not one to be shackled by morals and ethics as he pushes for ever greater heights. The cold, flat way he planned to simply murder Shinji and the others like it was nothing once they had outlived their usefulness this one fateful night is a true testament to how dark this character can actually get. It's clear that despite them all being Shinigami, despite them all living and working together, none of that means anything to Aizen. He never once saw them as anything more than cattle, than subjects to put to the slaughter once his work was done. Aizen would have butchered his captain and half the upper echelon of the Gote 13 that night and never looked back if he could have gotten away with it. The truth is that Aizen willfully uses each and every person he ever comes into contact with. From tiny one-off examples like Aizen allowing Gein to kill their third seat to test the child's strength, to Aizen sending his cronies out into the Rukongai to scrape away souls and fragments for his Hogyoku. Life means very little to Aizen if it stands in the way of his ambition. Even once his true nature 
is revealed, Eisen sees the Espada as little more than tools to be used by him, just the latest in a long, ever-growing line of victims, ruthlessly cutting down Harabel for no other reason than he realised just how weak the Espada were comparatively to him, even though before that she would have fought for him until the bitter end. And that takes us down to the smallest and most intimate of Aizen's evils, his manipulation and poisoning of those closest to him, the torture of Hinamori's mind, and the vindictive, spiteful way he continues to treat characters like Hitsugaya. Aizen may claim facetiously to respect the Gotei 13, but it's clear he isn't above treating some of them in a purely monstrous fashion, targeting Hitsugaya to exploit the captain's kindness and love for Hinamori. This is Aizen being evil without a reason, without a cause. Forcing Hitsugaya to stab Hinamori is nothing more than pure sadism, as he relishes in watching the tiny captain squirm time and time again, as if to hammer home a point, as if to hammer home the fact that their previous relationship, their previous friendship, was never real to begin with, as Aizen continues to try and sever himself from his most human of connections and emotions. There's just far too much. There are too many ways in which Aizen has negatively impacted the world of Bleach and the people that live within it. How many people have died as a result of Aizen's machinations? The entirety of Central 46? The victims of his monstrous experimental abomination White? the victims of his earlier holification experiments resulting in the deaths of Shinigami's students and Hisagi's crippling fear of battle for years to come. Even those Aizen might profess to be the closest things he has to friends, Gin and Tosun were both poisoned irreparably against the world by him in different ways. Nothing good has ultimately come for either of them by joining up with him in the end. Truth be told, Aizen is perhaps the closest thing Bleach has to the devil himself. Even his words, laced with malice and guile, are enough to drive people to destruction. But that's what makes him such a great character. He's the archetypal fallen angel, Lucifer himself, one who could have flown so high and a truly evil being. It might sound impossible to top that, but one character does. Were we sticking only to the source material, Aizen would have likely been number one, but when taking into consideration the light novels as well, one man stands above all others. Honestly, I didn't necessarily want to put Tokinada Suna Yashiro at the top of this list. It feels like the boring, predictable pick, but there's a reason he has to go here. The likes of Aizen and Yuhabak are true monsters, yes, but there is generally a method to their madness. They have their reasons, no matter how twisted for the terrible acts they commit. While those reasons might not make it any better, and it certainly doesn't excuse their actions, it at least adds context. And therefore, we as readers might be able to understand a little better the reasoning behind their choices. Tokinada has no such reason. Tokinada revels in chaos, in madness and pain, in suffering and sadism. Tokinada is evil, for evil's sake. Tokinada succumbed to a nihilistic worldview after learning the truth behind the Soul King and the creation of the Soul Society as we know it. As a result, he came to believe that all life was totally meaningless and treated all others as such, operating with nothing but pure malice. As a member of the most powerful and ancient noble house, Tokinada wields an immense amount of influence and used that control to torture and ruin lives. Despite being a high-born aristocrat, Tokinada chose to marry a commoner, hoping to give her a life of incredible, unimaginable happiness before ruthlessly tearing it all away in one fell swoop, wanting to watch her crumble and despair. In the end, although she defied him by eventually murdering his own wife, Tokinada is responsible for Tosun's endless despair, and his view that the world 
is a blood-soaked, unjust place, and is also responsible for Ginjo's betrayal at the hands of the Soul Society, another event that would force an unwitting person down a path of complete self-destruction. Tokinada enjoys witnessing the moment a person falls into soul-crushing despair, and lives for that rush, believing his time in this world means nothing anyway, so actively chooses to act in the worst way possible. It is a little cartoonish, and I do generally prefer when villains have some kind of motive, but actually it feels quite unique here among the world of Bleach, where so many of the villains are morally grey, Tokinada is flat out and purely evil without question. Everything Tokinada does is out of spite, whether that's mockingly naming his Zanpak toe in a way that refers to Kyoraku's cat in Kyokotsu, with whom he has a personal vendetta, to taunting his enemies upon his own death, knowing that he will never fully face adequate judgement for his crimes. At the end of the day, unlike the other characters on this list, many of whom may at least try to justify their actions, whether that's through ideology, survival, love, or conquest, Tokinada has no justification for his evil. He is in many ways a walking metaphor for the unjust nature of the world of Bleach, for how unfair life actually is, and how it does often dole out the absolute worst of punishment and sacrifice and sadness and suffering to those that don't necessarily deserve it, and how Tokinada is the kind of agent of chaos that laughs in the face of other people's despair. He's a maniac, a rabid dog, someone who exists purely to ruin the lives of others for his own sick amusement, and it's that lack of any direction, that total lack of humanity, that puts Tokinada at the top of this list. His evil may not be as all-encompassing or grand in scope as Yuhabak's, or as intricate and layered as Aizen's, but it is evil in its purest form. And without shackles of any kind, Tokinada's pure, tempestuous, unfettered evil is let loose on the world of Bleach like a rampaging beast to act without concern, without care, and without consequence. And that is the darkest and most dangerous form of evil of them all. Alright guys, but that's it for the video. As always, I really hope you enjoyed it. I put a lot of thought into this list. It was quite a difficult one to come up with, but at the end I'm quite happy with it. Do please let me know, as always, your thoughts and feelings regarding this list. How similar are our lists? I'm imagining there will be a fair bit of differentiation, but as always, let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Was there any one conspicuous that I forgot that I didn't add onto the list? Like I said at the start of the video, there were absolutely tons of potential choices here, so I'm bound to have missed someone. But regardless, as always, I really do hope you enjoyed it, and I want to end, as we always do, by saying a massive thank you and giving a huge shout-out to my supporters over on Patreon. I really do appreciate each and every one of you so, so very much, and if you like what I do here on YouTube and you want to support me over on Patreon as well, you can do just that. To get your name in the credits like this and to get every single video I release absolutely ad-free. Alright guys, but until next time, I'll catch you later, and I'll see you then.